This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Welcome to Asia in Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Um, <clears throat> our show today, Do Taiwan Political Parties Serve Citizens' Needs? And our guest is a very special guest joining us from the United Kingdom, where it is 4 a.m. in the morning, and I really appreciate him getting up so early. Uh, Dr. David Fell, he is the director of the Center for Taiwan Studies at the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. He is Britain's number one Taiwan expert, so we're very, very happy to have him on the show with us today. And again, really appreciate him getting up um, so very, very early in the morning. Welcome to Asia in Review. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be on the show. Uh, it's great to have you. Well, let's uh, get right into it because, unfortunately, we only have 30 minutes and the time really flies by. Um, would you classify Taiwan as a stable two-party system at this point? Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting um, uh, question. I mean, if we think comparatively, I think Taiwan has probably the, one of the most uh, stable party systems of any East Asian uh, democracy. Um, and it's seen quite a bit of variation in terms of what exactly is the uh, the party system? At the moment, we're going through a period of, of transition. Um, the uh, the KMT has suffered its worst ever uh, defeats. Um, so we really don't know. It really depends on on what kind of indices we're uh, we're using. Um, at the moment, we have basically one large and one medium sized party, along with maybe two uh, smaller parties. So it's quite a it's. The system is essentially in flux. Wait, would you, um, I, I, I'm glad that you said that you, that, that you phrased it that way. We have one major party and kind of a, this other party that at one time was major but has suffered a, a lot of setbacks. I, in my mind, I'm wondering if we should classify it as a one and a half party system. Um, I think it's a, um, uh, a tricky one um, um, because technically in terms of um, Parliamentarians, I think that uh, that works. But if we think in terms of, if we look at the um, local level, for example, then uh, you would you would probably st say it's still a two-party system. Uh, in terms of finance, uh, that's uh, still the case. So I'm quite reluctant uh, to go um, to take that that kind of uh, line. I know in the past, uh, following single election results, uh, we talked about Taiwan returning to a one-party dominant uh, system, and then that all changed in the next round of elections. So um, uh, I'd be cautious about that 1.5, uh, at least until the next round of elections. Uh, I, I, and I, I and of course, we point. do have another round of elections at the local level coming up just um, in a year and a half. I, I, I see your point on that, uh, on that issue. Um, well, uh, let me ask you this. Has the DPP proven that it can govern at their national level? I think most people would say that it proved itself as c capable of governing at the local level. Um, many um, mayors of Taiwan cities were DPP members. Chengdu, I guess, was the most prominent one, and all given very high marks for their, for their governance. But has the DPP proven that it can govern at the national level? Um, I think that's always been the... Um uh, the, the doubt that the, the KMT has, has raised about the, uh, the DUP, particularly given the experience of the DUP's first time in office between 2000 and, uh, and 2008, which is often seen as being a, a failed administration. Mm. Um, actually, when we look back at that period, there were actually a lot of pretty significant uh, achievements, particularly in Chen's uh, first term. We're talking about uh, Chen Shui Bian's first term, okay. We're talking about the, the first DUP. Okay. Uh, term. And that's one of the reasons why the question mark has been uh, raised for its um, its current administration back in, in power. Um, it's only been in power for, what is it, just over uh, a year. So I think it's, again, making a, um, a judgment is, is tricky. Clearly, um, there's very high expectations about what the DUP uh, is going to do post-2016. Mm. And whenever a new administration comes in, it raises expectations uh, to unachievable levels. Mm. Um, 
so far, uh, I would say that uh, the results seem quite mixed. My, my sense of talking to a lot of, for example, civil society actors is that there's quite a bit of impatience with the current DDP uh, administration. Um, Isn't that characteristic really of the Taiwan ahead, electorate, sorry. though, impatience? They seem to be so impatient and have such high expectations for politicians that they're, it, it, it's hard to escape failure, it seems. Uh, I think that, that's, uh, that's right. And I think, I guess, it's partly due to the way electoral politics works, that to get elected, you need to kind of raise expectations. Um, and that's why what often happens and I think it's happened with Chen, Ma, and also Tai, is that uh, their presidential satisfaction rates did decline quite quickly after they, they, uh, they came, uh, to, uh, to, came to, into office. You know, uh, it, it does seem to me, I, in my book at any rate, um, it, it seems that Tsai should be given credit for taking on the really hard problems, the pension reform, labor standards reform, th things that issues that the KMT sort of knew about but kicked down the road. And uh, she, she hasn't been shy from taking these problems on. I think you're, you're right. I think the, um, uh, the pensions issue, I think, is, is uh, really uh, critical. If you think that, mind you, had pretty substantial majorities particularly in his first and even in his, in his second term, but he wasn't really able to uh, deal with, um, uh, with pensions. Um, so I think Tsai has a lot of uh, courage there, and um, we've been seeing pretty um, passionate protests against these, uh, these reforms. Yeah. But overall, it looks like um, she actually has a degree of popularity, on, on, at least on this, uh, this issue. And in many ways, I think it's, it's, it's one of the great achievements of Taiwan's democracy that it has been able to develop quite significant social welfare reforms. And I think we're, here we're talking about a 20-plus uh, a year uh, cycle here. We've got very successful national health insurance um, and a gradual improvement in creating universal pensions, which for a new democracy, I think, is quite, um, is quite special. No, I, I agree with you. And the fact that she's taken on these thorny problems about pension reform, it's, it seems to me there's some lessons here for the U.S. Congress who, who, who knows that the Social Security, or what you might call national pension plan, is in jeopardy, and they simply don't do anything about it. And it is they, either both parties just sort of stray away from the problem. Maybe they should take a few lessons from that side. I think, um, I mean, I would say they should take lessons from, from Taiwan. I mean, because... Uh, I can remember, okay, this is a little bit historical, back in the 1990s, um, some election advertisements that were talking about national health insurance in Taiwan. And the, uh, the point that was made was that uh, Taiwan could do this, but Bill Clinton uh, wasn't able to mm. um, uh, get these kind of reforms through. Um, and I think that, um, I mean, you've stayed in Taiwan. You know how well the health service works oh, it's um, yeah, in, in Taiwan. Uh, even as um, as a European, uh, I think we're quite impressed with the uh, the efficiency of the of the system. Mm. And I, I mean, I used to uh, get my dental treatment in, in Taiwan whenever I went went back. And even my son I, is still. I've taken uh, advantage does, of that as this. well. <laughs> it just we don't have waiting lists in in Taiwan at, at hospitals, which is a constant theme of conversation in the UK. Mm. Well. Um, do you see, uh, I, I, I so clearly remember when uh, Chen Shui bin um, you know, he, he, in, in his first term, he at first tried to be friends with China, and then, you know, people in his party thought that he wasn't pursuing, of course, Tsai is not particularly trying to be friends with China, uh, with China, but she's not really pursuing a line of independence. And when Chen Shui bin was in office, this sort of got him in trouble in the sense that Lots of people, a reasonable number of people, bolted the party. They formed the TSU. Do you see any possibility that uh, some of the darker green members of the uh, DPP might bolt the party and join up with the TSU or form their own party? Do you see any possibility of that happening? I mean, it's an interesting uh, question. Um, will, I mean, if we look at Taiwan's party history, we have seen a number of significant party splits. Um, often this ends up with these politicians actually merging back. Um, so 
ideology is is one factor in 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 pushing these splits, but also uh, party strength. And I would say at the moment, I can't really really envision envisage uh, DUP politicians uh, switching off. And if they did, um, uh, the TSU doesn't look like a a, a viable location. Mm, uh, I would have thought that the uh, New Power Party looks to be the stronger of the two um, pan green smaller parties. Now, that's an but, interesting one, and it kind of is a, is a convenient segue into a question I wanted to ask. Is so I've heard some people say they don't think the New Power Party is going to be around very long. Well, I think that's an interesting, um, interesting point. Um, history would tell us that that um, is a good prediction because generally the smaller parties have they've had a uh, they had their moment and then gone into uh, decline. Now the big test for the um, new power party is going to be these upcoming local elections in in 2018. Can they actually survive at the local level when smaller parties didn't have tended to do quite poorly in these local level? Uh, elections mm. uh, and of course uh, these would be multi-member district elections which offers a quite different challenge and and of course the new power party is probably distancing itself a little bit from the uh, from the DUP um, my prediction is it should do pretty well um, um, because it's 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 got a, ba uh, a base from the earlier national elections it has stars um, and to a large extent, it seems to have won the battle of alternative uh, parties hmm. through the uh, uh, 2016 um, uh, results. So I was quite surprised um, when uh, you mentioned that one of your your, uh, your speakers had, had had suggested that New Power Party was going to uh, disappear. Um, I'm relatively optimistic um, in terms of how it's going to perform. Uh, in contrast, um, I would be more concerned if I was a member of one of the other traditional splinter parties like the TSU, PFP, um, who have really kind of um, struggled to find a role in Taiwanese mm, uh, I politics agree. I agree with um, that. post uh, 2016. Well, how, how about the KMT? Um, <clears throat> um, What's its future? It seems to be, some people would say, and maybe this is a bit of an unfair characterization, but it's the party of old people. What's the KMT's future? And we sort yeah, of said it's a half party in the beginning anyway. <laughs> I think it's, that's a, uh, um, a great question. And if, if um, again, as someone who's been looking at Taiwanese politics um, for 20 plus years, it's it's quite hard to imagine that the KMT would get into such a mess again. Um, of course, it, it did mess up in, in, in 2000, but was quite successful at actually learning lessons uh, of defeat. Uh, this time it was, um, I mean, we had a very interesting reaction to 2016 where the KMT el elected a chairperson who was unelectable as a presidential uh, candidate. Mm. Um, and I think this definitely did the party a lot of damage. So having Hong Xiuju as their, their chairperson for the next, um, uh, well, almost a year and a half, taking a very um, hardline position on um, relations with China. And I think uh, if we come back to your term polarization, this definitely was a polarizing move from the party. Now, of course, the party has reacted to that in electing a new chairperson, uh, Wu Dun Yi, mm. who clearly um, has quite a different vision of the party from, from home. You know, um, I'm, I'm glad that you yeah, mentioned go ahead. that. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, go ahead. Now, you know, um, I, I saw something very interesting the other day, and I, I have yet to verify it. Um, okay, Wu Dun Yi made a statement, uh, I guess he's just, he, he was elected and just assumed the, the chair uh, position of the KMT, and he said that he embraced the 92 consensus. The way he said it sounded <clears throat> un, um, unlike the way Ma talked about the 92 consensus. He, uh, Ma always talked about the 92 consensus with respective interpretations. Yi Zhong Go Biao. Yeah. 
And I didn't read that into Wu Dengyi's statement. He just said he embraced the 92 consensus, which seems to be the way that the mainland is pushing the 92 consensus now. The mainland doesn't seem to want to put up or tolerate any of this, you know, respective interpretation business. It wants to really push on 92 consensus, one China policy, forget anything else. Do you have any view on that? Um, I, mean, I haven't actually um, looked at this in detail. My sense is often it depends on who's the audience or who is the target audience mm. uh, for a, a statement. So it's possible he's, he was saying something to uh, to reassure the, the Chinese side, because I think he has said uh, things that have upset the uh, the Chinese uh, side. I think he, he's reported to have said something quite critical of about um, unification and unification uh, supporters. So uh, I think clearly he's trying to be more moderate than, than Hong. And I think I would say that he's moving back to the kind of um, mind your first term kind of position. That's a very interesting um, point because I've always perceived him to be one who was not especially enthusiastic about unification. He sort of put up with the rhetoric about it, but he was not one, you know, that was really, you know, ready to push this ahead full steam. He was somewhat wary about it. I think you're, you're right that uh, for mind you, uh, eventual unification is part of his core ideology. Um, well, I think um, with a lot of KMT politicians, uh, if they are going to use the word uh, unification, they're really just giving it uh, lip service. Mm. And I, I would say to a certain extent, um, Wu fits into that category. He's someone who's got real grassroots uh, local election experience. He, he has a better understanding of, of voters. He's been uh, Gaoshan mayor, he's been uh, mayor of Nanto, he's been a Nanto legislator. Uh, I think he's even been a, a city councillor in, in Taipei. Okay. So he's got a better idea at least how older generation voters think. Okay. Um, and I think that's why um, he's been able to get um, elected um, in quite an interesting uh, chairman's uh, race. But does this actually make the KMT an electable party? I think uh, I don't get a sense that there's a huge amount of optimism. Um, the party won't collapse, but I think um, it's not going to be in a position for challenging seriously in uh, in 2020. Okay, I'm getting told here we really have to take a break. So well, that's what we'll do here. We'll come back and we'll uh, we'll continue this conversation. You're watching okay. Asia in Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. My guest today is Dr. David uh, Fell, joining us from the United Kingdom, where it is 4 a.m., actually around 4.20 a.m., uh, Tuesday morning. We really appreciate him getting up so very, very early in the, uh, in the morning. We'll be right back. Don't go away. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. We have this crazy thing going on today. I was just walking by and all these DJs and producers are set up all around the city. I just walked by and I said, what's happening, guys? They told me they were making music. There were a lot of people that claimed they had no musical talent and then sat down and kind of played some really nice sounds. So we do it. Welcome back to Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Our show today, Do Taiwan Political Parties Serve Citizens' Demands? And our guest is noted British Taiwan expert, Dr. David Fell. Uh, Dr. Fell is the director of the Center for Taiwan Studies at the School of Oriental and African Studies, uh, which is part of the University of London. Um, oh, where should we go from here? 
Okay. Um, let me ask you this question. I'm really curious to hear your point of view on this, and then we really should move on and talk about uh, a few other things. To what degree, percentage-wise, let's try to be as scientific and, uh, 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 about this as possible. To what degree is Taiwan democratic? To what degree is Taiwan still authoritarian? Okay. Um, I mean, I would say overall, Taiwan ranks as a, a pretty democratic um, a place. If we think about what, what kind of um, indices we we use when we measure democracy. I think um, freedom of press, um, um, free and fair elections, um, strong party system, um, strong and critical civil society. I think on all these key indices, then Taiwan performs extremely well. And I think if we think about things like the, um, the Sunflower Movement, mm. uh, we can see that civil society plays a really important uh, role. Uh, of course, Taiwan is still, to a certain extent, in the shadow of its authoritarian history, as any other former authoritarian country um, uh, would be. And, and I think um, a lot of this came out with the anniversary, the 30th anniversary of the lifting of, of martial law and the degree that we still do see some uh, continuity. But I think comparatively, I think Taiwan performs, Taiwan's democracy performs extremely well. So will we say 90% democratic, 10% authoritarian, 95% democratic, 5% authoritarian? Yeah, I think 90-10 um, uh, sounds about right. I mean, I tend to, um, there's been a big debate about the, the um, health of Taiwan's democracy. And I've tended to be on the more kind of positive side of, of, that, uh, of that debate. Mm. Mm. That's great. Well, um, let's take a minute or so here to talk about the School of Oriental and African Studies, which is a great, great, great place to study about Asia and, and specifically your program, uh, the program, the master's level program in Taiwan Studies. Could you, could you tell our audience a bit about it? Yeah, we were established in 1999. and We started off with a, um, a single course on contemporary Taiwan and then gradually over time uh, we've expanded the uh, the teaching and academic uh, events program. So currently we have um, eight um, regular courses on, on Taiwan that, that cover things like Taiwan's politics and cross-strait relations, uh, Taiwan's international relations, Taiwan's legal issues, Taiwan film, oh, um, no, Taiwanese great. language, uh, culture and society in Taiwan. Most of the courses are postgraduate courses uh, but we have a couple of, of undergrad courses as well. And in addition to the, the teaching program, we have probably the, uh, the most active Taiwan events program. Um, so we have something like 50 to 60 Taiwan studies academic events or public events uh, per year. Okay. Uh, so it's a very uh, active uh, program. That's great. So it well, started off very small and, and has expanded, particularly over the last... Uh, 10, 15 years. Okay. Um, we're sort of running, uh, time is running on, so we want to talk about uh, a book that you very recently edited uh, called Taiwan Social Movements Under Mind Joe. We have about four minutes left here. Could you give us kind of um, an overview of, of the book? Well, basically the book tries to tell the story of um, Taiwan civil society in the Mind Joe era, so 2008 to, to 20. Uh, 16. And the way we do that is through a range of social movement uh, case studies that look at issues such as um, sunflower movement, wild strawberry, um, labor movement, uh, movement, uh, indigenous um, uh, rights movements. Um, and we, we look at why these movements emerge, how they've developed, um, how we measure their impact uh, and how we explain their impact. So it's a really kind of, um, it was a really exciting project for me because I'm a, my main work is on political parties. So it was something a little bit new for me to kind of get into. Mm. Um, but for me, it was, it was a real learning experience. And it was a great time to be looking at Taiwanese social, social movements when they were transforming the country. Mm, mm, mm. Interesting. And, um, we, we should probably also mention that you are the book editor for um, Taiwan-related books for Rutledge Publishing Company. Um, 
So we're, we're getting down to our last two minutes. Um, and I, I think we should also mention that you are, uh, um, should we call it a mover and shaker in the uh, European Association for Taiwan Studies, if I have that correct. Yeah, well, um, that was one of my, my big achievements, establishing the European Association of Taiwan Studies, which runs a big conference um, every year at a different European uh, location. So I was involved in, in that project for the first um, eight or nine years, and then I've passed that on to other more efficient uh, colleagues. But perhaps one thing I would add is that one of our um, new projects is the International Journal of Taiwan Studies. Mm. Um, and that should be coming out in 2018. Again, I'm on that committee, but I'm not the real driver of that. But I think it's a, it says something about the health of the, uh, the field of Taiwan studies. I think overall in Europe, um, I think uh, we're pretty pleased about the way Taiwan studies has developed. Oh, that's very interesting. Now, the, um, uh, the European Association for Taiwan Studies, as I understand it, is supported financially by the Zhang Jingguo Foundation. Is that correct? Yeah, they're one of the, um, the main financial financial donors together. But I think it's also become quite um, self-sufficient uh, over the last few years through membership fees um, and uh, and conference fees. So oh. initially, Jianjin Guo Foundation basically was the sole financial source, but that's it's become much more balanced now. Well, unfortunately, the clock has caught up with us again, as this happens, seems to happen every week about this time. And I really would like to thank you so very, very much for getting up so very early in the morning to join us via Skype for this interview. I think uh, the audience and myself have benefited quite a bit from your comments. Uh, you're obviously a very dedicated scholar of Taiwan, and it's great to have you on the show. It's been a pleasure, and thanks for the important contribution you're making through the show for Taiwan Studies. Oh, well, thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you for watching, um, I, 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 those of you in our uh, audience. Uh, I put in a note here, I'll be leaving uh, Asian Review to go, uh, well, at least for four months. I've uh, been given a grant for the Center for Taiwan Studies at Fudan University. And so I'll be headed off for Shanghai um, uh, on August 31st. Uh, of course, I'll be visiting Taiwan several times soon then. In fact, I'll be stopping in Taiwan on my way to Shanghai to conduct a number of uh, interviews. So we'll see you in the future sometime. Uh, taking my place will be Miss Lily Ong, um, who is um, very internationally minded, and, um, I, I, and I'm sure that she will be in good hands. So as I say in Hawaii, a hui ho until we see you again.